weighing on their minds here. Uh, yeah, Nicole. Okay, let's take a look here right quick. Open this up so I can screen cap the problem. Oh, yeah, this is the hard one, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's try this one. Sorry. You're okay. Were you were you late coming in from traffic? No, no. I, I should have talked to Chris Rule because he's got a car. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Okay, so, oh my goodness. So it says two toy racetracks form concentric circles. Each track is divided into 15 identical sections. If the inside car travels 1.2 centimeters less than the outer car on each piece of track, how much bigger is the radius of the outside track compared to the inside track? And then our hint says, set up two equation using, equations using the arc length formula and use substitution to solve. Round your answer to the hundredth. So I'm going to start by just kind of drawing myself a picture of the situation. When it says concentric circles, what does that mean? So two circles that same share the same center, right? So it's like one circle inside of another. Kind of looks like a bullseye. So I'll just sketch myself a little picture of that. That's a lumpy looking circle, but good enough for what we're about to do. So far, so good. Okay. So they share the same center. So I'm going to draw just one of those, say, 15 identical <coughs> sections. Everybody's okay with that? So let's, let's just stop. So I'm going to call this Ri. because it's the radius of the inside circle. I'm going to call this RO. That'll be the radius of the outside circle. I'm going to call that SO. That's the arc for a section on the outside circle. I'm going to call this SO. That'll be an arc on the um, one of this one of the sections for the that should be SI come on Mr. Kulik uh, SI will be one of the arcs for one of the inside sections and I'm going to call that angle there the central angle for both sectors theta Is everybody okay with how I've kind of set this up? And I know to do this because it says set up two equations using the arc length formula. So there's my two equations. Notice that the theta is the same for both of these, right? Everybody see that? 
So let's, I'm going to start by calculating what that theta has to be for each. So I can plug that into my formulas. The piece here that's going to tell me how to do that oops. Oh my gosh, come on now. Stop, stop, stop. Is that this, there's 15 identical sections. So how many degrees are in a circle in total? 360. If I take that 360 degrees and I split it up into 15 identical sections, What do I get here? Well, type that into my calculator. It's going to be like uh, 24 or something, but I don't trust my mental math enough at 922 this morning. 24. So far, so good. Um, but notice the sector formula I used is the radian one. So I'm going to just convert that into radians just so I can use the less complicated formula. Is everybody okay there? So to do that, I just multiply then by pi over 180. And now I could simplify this more, but I don't care. This is not a final answer. It's just a number that I'm going to use in a formula later on to get the answer I'm actually looking for. So I'm not going to bother reducing this because it's not a final answer. It's just going to be something I plug in later. Everybody's cool. Could I reduce it if I wanted to? Sure. Forget it. It's not worth it. Everybody cool with the reasoning there? Okay. Again, it's very easy in the once you get like higher up in the math class to get bogged down on like simplifying things and it doesn't really, don't really need to do it to get to the final answer if it's all going to go in the calculator eventually anyway. Like let's just deal with it then, right? Okay. So the next piece that I'm going to use is it says the inside car travels 1.2 centimeters less than the outer car on each piece of track. So I know that the inside arc is equal to the outside arc minus 1.2. That's telling us the inside section arc is 1.2 less than the outer arc. So I'm going to use that now and substitute in along with uh, our angle. So in place of SI, I'm going to write SO. So far, so good. Okay. Now, the last piece here in figuring out how to answer this is going to be looking at what it actually wants. It wants how much bigger is the radius of the outside track compared to the inside track. What it's really looking for, then, is RO minus RI. You guys read that? I'm not actually have enough information to solve for either RO 
or are I the way things are current, what's currently given to me? Because if I look at my system, how many variables do you see in that system? Three variables, but two equations. I know I'm not going to solve that, be able to solve that system completely, but what I can do if I call this equation A and this one equation B, if I do equation B minus equation A, I get this equation. You guys kind of see how I did that. I think just hi highlighting it kind of helps see where the stuff is coming from. I try to do that for you guys, especially if I'm doing something kind of like sneaky algebraic like this, where this probably looks a little bit different than how you would solve a system before. Considering it said use substitution, I didn't actually do. I mean, I did a substitution, you know, when I uh, replaced SI with that stuff. But now I'm using like elimination, and I guess the hint is kind of ambiguous there. Anyway, so if I simplify, here I distribute my negative through. So I have S not or S0, I was SO minus SO plus 1.2. And if I look at the left-hand side, I notice that there's a greatest common factor in common there. So I'll just pull that out to the front. Those two guys are go bye bye, right? Because I just have SO minus SO, so I'm left with just the 1.2 there. And then I'm going to multiply, or now I just have to get rid of this, right? To move that fraction over, I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal. You could think about by dividing by a fraction, but I think that's weird and often like I'm going to screw up the arithmetic doing that, especially getting into my calculator is a pretty big hassle. So rather, I'm just going to think about multiplying by the reciprocal. Does that ring a bell? So I have 1.2 and then times 180 over 24 pi. And that should be my difference. So now it's just calculator time. So I'm going to do that horizontal fraction bar, alpha y equals, and then pick option 1. Because if I try to do it with a division bar, I'd have to remember to put a parenthesis around the entire 24 pi <coughs> if I'm using the division. I don't want to have to hassle with that. I'd rather just be able to type it the way it looks in my calculator. And so I get 2.86-ish uh, centimeters, I think. Now that's a challenging problem. Would I ever ask you to do something that complicated on a quiz or a test? My answer is no. Is it good practice and homework though? Does it help connect some of these ideas and tie in some Algebra 2 skills that maybe we haven't thought about in a while? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Will you see things in the homework that's harder than the things I'll ask you to do on the quiz and the test? Occasionally. Okay. Not often, but occasionally. And I'd rather have it that way, right? I'd rather see the hard stuff when I have time to think about it and ask questions than the reverse, right? Where the homework's really easy and the test and quiz are really hard. That's not very fair. Um, other questions from homeworks? Cool. All right. Um, 
So originally on the agenda, I had us doing 2, 3, and 2, 4 today. I think I'm just going to do 2, 3 and then give you a delta math assignment based on 2, 3 to worry about afterwards. So I'll adjust the homework because we're only going to do one section also. Um, but this is, a, this is a skill that I think is, if you don't get this right away, life becomes really difficult in the coming sections and chapters. So I want to really like take a day and kind of settle in on this. Is it's not a difficult skill, um, but it's something I want to make sure we have some practice on because, again, it can become big problems if you just can't do it. Okay? Um, so recall from geometry, When we measure an angle, we always look at the smaller way of measuring it, right? We always look at this angle rather than like that angle, right? So in geometry, we always measure our angle with like the smaller option than the bigger one, right? As a result, the biggest angle we can draw in geometry was the 180 degree angle. What we're going to do today is devise a system for us to be able to draw an angle of any real number size. So it can be bigger than 180, it can be bigger than 360, it can be positive, it can be negative. It doesn't matter. We're going to be able to draw any sized angle with this new method of drawing angles and this new way of kind of thinking about that that we're going to do right now. And this is the skill that, like, we have to be able to do, right? Like, coming skills are going to stack on top of this, and if you're bad at this, it kind of makes the next stuff impossible if you can't do this well. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. Instead of defining or defining an, arc, an angle as like, okay, it has two arms and a vertex, right? We're going to say, okay, we're going to impose the xy axis onto our angle. So every angle now is going to be, we're going to place its vertex at the origin of the xy axis and we're going to place one arm of the angle on the positive x-axis. We call this one the initial side. We then, based on the size of the angle that we want to draw, are going to rotate from the positive, positive x-axis counterclockwise the desired degrees. So if I want a 190 degree angle, I could not draw this before, I can now. So I start at the positive x-axis. Every quadrant on the x-axis is how many degrees? So like from here to here, 90, right? Every quadrant is 90 degrees, so I've gone 90 degrees. And then to here, how far have I gone? 180, and then I'm gonna go 10 degrees more. I don't know how much 10 degrees really is, I'm just gonna kinda eyeball it. Less than half, though. Does everybody feel okay with that idea? All right. What if we wanted to do something that's bigger than 360? Mr. Kulik, isn't there just like four quadrants on our um, XY axis? Like how are you gonna do an angle that's bigger than 360? Well, let me show you. 
let's say let's do a 500 degree angle. So I'm going to start the same way. So I'm going to start at the positive x-axis and rotate counterclockwise. So 90, 180, 270, 360, 450, and then like 50 more. So I just keep spinning around. It's like the clock, right? There's only 60 minutes on there. How do I do two hours? We just go around twice. Oh, okay. This is not so bad, right? Do you have to be able to count? Yeah, a little bit. But it's not too bad. Uh, well, Mr. Kulik, you also said we're going to be able to do negative angles. Right? How am I going to do a negative angle? So both the previous two examples we've done were positive angles. And which way did we rotate? We went counterclockwise. If it's a negative angle, guess what we're going to go? Clockwise. So we're at like negative 90 and like negative 60 more. Puts us somewhere over here. What do you guys think? Okay. Do me a favor. On your paper, take a moment and draw for me a 45 degree angle and a um, 405 degree angle and tell me what you see. Okay, you can do them on the same x, y axis if you want, or you can just do them right next to each other. Either is fine, but just take a moment and practice this once for me, and we'll, I'll draw them together in a minute. What did you notice when you drew your two angles? The stopping arm, we need to give that a name. I forgot to do that earlier. This is called the terminal side. Let me go back and re add that piece of vocab there. So you have the initial side, and the one that rotates is the terminal side. So in that example we just did with 45 and 405, we saw that the terminal sides of both angles land in the exact same location. Everybody see that? So they're kind of like the same angle, right? They're not the same because they have different measures, but they're kind of the same because the terminal side and the initial side are in the exact same locations. Let's give that situation a special name. We're going to call those co-terminal angles. Oh boy, that where did that put? It's not at all where I had my cursor. So those co-terminal angles are just angles that have different measurements but they have the same terminal side. 
like 45 and 405. What do you notice about 445 and 405? What is the difference between them? 360 degrees. Do you think that's a coincidence? No, right? If I go to 45 and I do a full 360, I land back at 45 again, right? So all coterminal angles, if two angles are coterminal, the difference between the two angles has to be a multiple of 360. Could be more than 360, could be 720, could be you know 1080, could be a multiple of 360, and it could be negative, right? You could have to subtract 360 a couple of times, but that's the gist of it. Let's do a couple of quick examples here where we practice finding some coterminal angles. So find two angles coterminal with 47 degrees. So to do that, I can take 47, and I can add 360 to it. That would be fine. And then I can take that answer and add 360 again. And there's another answer, and I could just keep, if I wanted another one, I could add 360 again, and again, and again, and again. I can get infinitely many of these things, right? Or, instead of adding 360, what else could I have done? Subtract 360. And it works the same way, right? Everybody happy? So how many possible answers would you have for part A? infinitely many answers, right? Like you can just keep adding or subtracting 360 until the cows come home and uh, you'll keep getting correct answers. Now in the answer book, do you think I'm gonna list all of them? Yes. No, I couldn't possibly list them all. So we'll just list a few. But if you're like, oh, I did sub added 360 11 times, like rest assured that answer will not be in the answers, but it's, it's a correct answer still. Could still be correct. Uh, part B, find two angles coterminal with pi over 3. Oh, Mr. Kulak, what the heck is pi over 3? It's an angle in radians. So can I add 360 degrees to an angle in radians? No, because the units are different. What I'm going to do is I'm going to convert 360 into radians, and then we'll add whatever that value is, or subtract if, you, if that's your preference. So to convert 360 degrees to radians, I multiply by pi over 180, and I get 2 pi. That's something that would be nice to remember, that 360 is the same as 2 pi. Should be relatively easy to remember because 2 pi is nice. That's a nice round, no fraction in that. Okay. So pi over 3 plus 2 pi. What do I need to do to add those together? need a common denominator. What would the common denominator be in this case? 3. So if I multiply the top and bottom of 2 pi over 1 by 3, I get 6 pi over 3, right? 
What is pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3? Uh, what is pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3? What was that, Nicole? 7 pi over 3. Mm -hmm. Everybody okay there? So there's one answer. To get my second answer, I can take that and add 2 pi again. I know since the denominator is 3, I need to write 2 pi is 6 pi over 3. I'm not going to make a common denominator a second time since I already did it up there. I'll just copy that down because it still has this denominator of 3. So when I add those together, I get 13 pi over 3. And that's another answer, and I could keep doing this you know, and get 19 pi over 3 and 25 pi over 3 and yada, 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 a bunch of times. Okay, pause. Question for you guys. Who here has low confidence in their ability to do operations with fractions in them? Okay, it's okay. Let me show you this on your calculator. So if you have your calculator with you and you have low fractions confidence or you're like, yeah, I just like would like to learn how to use this thing a little bit better because I spent a bunch of money on it. I don't really know how to use it yet. I welcome you to take this, take yours out and follow along. Uh, of course. So let's say we're trying to do Yep, sure. Trying to do this. Pi over 3 plus 2 pi. If I try typing this into my calculator with the pi's in here, the calculator will just give me a decimal and can only give me a decimal. However, if I just take the pi's off, do the fraction, and then just put a pi back on at the end, my calculator will help me out with that. So instead of writing pi over 3, I'm going to write 1 over 3. So I'm going to use that horizontal fraction command. I'm going to press alpha, y equals, and I'm going to type in 1 over 3. I'm just taking the pi off. Remember, there's a 1 in front of the pi. Right? There's always a coefficient of 1 in front of everything. And then I'll write plus, instead of 2 pi, I'm just going to write 2. And if I press enter, that gives me 7 thirds. And I just stick the pi back into the numerator. Everybody's okay there? Now if I wanted to add 2 pi to this again, I can just press plus. And then the 2, and there's my 13. And I have to put the pi back in, pi over 3. Isn't that lovely? That horizontal fraction command is a really helpful, helpful <coughs> operation on your calculator, especially if, like, fractions and I don't get along very well. If you're that, you know, if you're just like, I just don't like them. That's helpful, right? On a quiz or a test, would I ever need to see you making common denominators to add fractions? No. Okay, you don't need to show me that work. That's not like within the scope of this class. You can certainly use your calculator to kind of move through that if you have trouble adding fractions. This won't be the only time where we have to do like operations where you're adding and subtracting, you know, things in radians that are fractional together. So, everybody happy there? This is what I wanted to show you today, okay? The critical skill that you're going to need to have coming out of today 
is if I give you an angle, you're able to draw that angle and get the terminal side close to where it really belongs. Okay? So it needs to absolutely needs to be in the correct quadrant for sure. And it really kind of, for me at least, you know, like it needs, to, if it's less than halfway into the quadrant or more than halfway, like you need to have that. Um, to help you practice that, I made a delta math assignment. Let me just show you what that's going to look like. Oh my goodness, okay. Thought I was in already. Try that again. There we go. Okay. So I have um, four things to work on. So the first one is estimating angle measurements. So they've drawn us a angle and they want us to estimate about how many degrees that is. So I have 90 to here, 90 more, and then how much does this little piece here look like? It looks to me like maybe it's a third of that next quadrant, so maybe 30 degrees. So maybe I'd guess 210. So I do that. It says, oh, good. And I actually, it was exactly 210, spot on. As long as you're within 10 degrees on your estimate, it'll take it as correct. If you're off by more than 10 degrees, it'll mark it wrong and just have you do another one. It's <coughs> okay so far? Fairly straightforward, right? Next one is going to be, it wants us to do some of these angles of rotation. So what you're going to do, it says to do negative 179 degrees, and it says within 10 degrees. So I'm going to take the yellow, and I'm going to rotate that until I've done 179, or what I think is negative 179 degrees. Since it's negative, I'm going to be going clockwise. So I'm just going to grab, holding down the mouse button as I'm spinning. And negative 179 is almost 180. I'll do something like that. And hit submit. And it says, yes, it says I gave them out negative 178, but it's within 10 degrees, so it marked as correct. Everybody feel okay doing that? So you're kind of drawing your own. It says rotating with large angles now. So this one wants 855. Woo! All right, here we go. So I'm going to do the same thing. 90, 180, 270, 360, 450, 540, 630, 720, 810, and then like 45 more would be like halfway-ish. And it says I gave them 859, but that was good enough. Everybody's okay on what I was doing there on how to do that. Again, not super difficult, but if you're not precise, it'll just make you do another one. And the last one is finding coterminal angles. <laughs> so it says find an angle coterminal to negative 126 but it wants that angle between zero and 360. So do I need an angle that's bigger than 126 or smaller? It has to be between zero and 360. Bigger. bigger. So I should be adding 360, yeah. and I'll just keep adding 360 to negative 126 until I get something that lands between zero and 360. Well, doing it one time should be sufficient there, right? Since it's negative 126, I know that that's going to give me, if I add 360 to that, that's going to be bigger than 0 and less than 360. So there we go, 234. 
submit. There we go. You guys feel okay? Clear as to what the Delta Mass is going to ask you to do. Um, in addition to that, um, we're going to add to your problem set for not Sunday, but next Sunday. Um, we're going to ask you guys to do Oh, I lied. We are up through 44. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So I just have like three problems to add, or two problems to add, right? We were up to 42 before, correct? Yeah, just 43 and 44 would be the only two new ones. Because um, we're not going to do Section 2 for today, because I wanted to have time in class for you guys to practice like estimating these angles and drawing these angles because it's a really important skill that if you don't have this makes it really hard to draw the correct picture and label things correctly and we're going to get to a point where you do this almost every single time you have to draw some picture so we're going to practice this today and the delta math was actually nice in that it doesn't take up a lot of space on your paper to practice this um, I'm going to be done talking now. You can take out your tablets. You start on the Delta Math, or you can start on the homework if you're still catching up with the previous set of homework and you're like, yo, I need to practice this part before I go on to something else, I understand. Um, or if you want to start with 43 and 44, it's like, it's two problems. I'm going to for totally forget about this. It's not due on Sunday, though, so it's not a big deal. It'll just be part of next Sunday's problem set. The only thing due on Sunday is 1 through 42, and that'll be turned in into your OneNote. Should we practice how to do that? Okay. All right. For this time and this time only, if you have your cell phone on your person, you may take it out. We'll practice how to get something into from your paper into your OneNote. If you're doing your homework in OneNote, you don't have to follow along with this. But if you're a paper person, um, this is my recommendation for you. So what you're going to want to do with your phone is you're going to want to take pictures of your homework. The best way to do this is through the Notes app. So if you go into your Notes and you open a note in your iCloud folder, you guys know what I'm talking about? If you have an iPhone anyways, if you don't have an iPhone, ignore me. I don't know what to do if you don't have an iPhone. You can just like take regular pictures and you have a lot of things. But if you have um, notes and you have an iCloud account, like you pay the extra money to have the expanded the backup space, which I think probably almost everybody does because the cell phones have enough memory to store your backup and do anything with it anymore. Um, is everybody okay? If you look at, if you click on the screen somewhere, on the bar above your keyboard is something that has a picture of a camera on it. Do you see like the camera? Click that and you're gonna hit select like scan documents. And if you just hold the phone over your paper it'll like take the picture automatically. You don't have to press anything. It's just like, oh, that's a page. I'll take it. And you do that for all your pages of homework. It'll put it all into one PDF. Once you've got all your homework captured, um, go to the file, and you'll just email that to yourself, okay? If you're having trouble doing this, I'll be happy to look at you one-on-one one, one -on -one in a minute because I, I can't put my cell phone on the screen to project it to show you like what I'm touching and depending on the iPhone you're using, my operating system is probably jankier than yours because my iPhone is very old because I don't buy a new one every year because it's, I feel like they're just extorting me by destroying the battery efficiency. I'm going to hang on to it as long as I can without paying for one. Um, so let's say that, let me find a good one here. Uh, 
that's not what I want. I want to have some pretty one of these guys. Okay. So this is a student that was emailed me a homework assignment from another class. But what I would do is I would get the email from myself that has the PDF attachment to it. I'd click on the PDF. I'll hit the print button. And then hit the print button here. And the destination I'm going to pick is going to be OneNote Desktop. You might have to do see more to get that to come up. So you pick that. I'm going to print all the pages. I hit print. And then if I click in OneNote, this prompts, this pops up prompting me to, hey, tell me where you want to put that. So maybe I say, okay, I want to put it in the sixth hour notebook, and my name is Ava, and I'm going to put it in the homework section, and I hit OK. Ava, I'm going to take this out once I just show everybody. And then I'll change the name to like chapter two, problem set number one or something. And then it's in. And it's beautiful. Um, I'm just going to delete this out now, Ava. Just, I was using you as an example because you were like at the top of the alphabet. Everybody okay? If you want to do that now and practice doing that, even if you're not putting your actual homework assignment in, if it's just like, I just need to do this once so I have like some feeling like I know how to do this, that's perfectly fine. You can have your cell phone out if you're doing, you're just practicing doing that. Um, I'll trust that like once you've done your practice and you're like, okay, I think I got it, you put it away. Um, if I see you like 20 minutes later and you're still using it, we'll have a conversation. But um, does that feel okay? That to me feel is, is the easiest way to do it because I don't have to save anything. I don't have to get it onto my computer. I don't have to, you know, like if I do the notes, all the pictures are in one place. So I just have to print one thing in there. I don't have to like, if it's four pages, I don't have to do that four separate times. That's the way I think is the most efficient. But again, like if you're, as long as it gets in there, I'm not going to complain. I'm just trying to show you what I found was the easiest way to do that. Um, I'm stopping to, I'm going to stop talking now and let you guys work on one of those three things, whether it's practicing, getting your stuff from paper into your OneNote, finishing your previous homework assignment, or working on this new Delta Math. I will let you guys prioritize to whatever is the highest priority for you right now. Paige. Of course.